Chapter Three of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. The Coming of Pollyanna. In due time came the telegram announcing that Pollyanna would arrive in Beldingsville the next day, the twenty-fifth of June, at four o'clock. Miss Polly read the telegram, frowned, then climbed the stairs to the attic room. She still frowned as she looked about her. The room contained a small bed, neatly made, two straight-backed chairs, a washstand, a bureau without any mirror and a small table. There were no drapery curtains at the dormer windows, no pictures on the wall. All day the sun had been pouring down upon the roof, and the little room was like an oven for heat. As there were no screens, the windows had not been raised. A big fly was buzzing angrily at one of them now, up and down, up and down, trying to get out. Miss Polly killed the fly, swept it through the window, raising the sash an inch for the purpose, straightened a chair, frowned again, and left the room. Nancy, she said a few minutes later at the kitchen door, I found a fly upstairs in Miss Pollyanna's room. The window must have been raised at some time. I have ordered screens, but until they come I shall expect you to see that the windows remain closed. My niece will arrive tomorrow at four o'clock. I desire you to meet her at the station. Timothy will take the open buggy and drive you over. The telegram says, Light hair, red-checked gingham dress, and straw hat. That is all I know, but I think it is sufficient for your purpose. Yes, ma'am, but you— Miss Polly evidently read the pause aright, for she frowned and said crisply, No, I shall not go. It is not necessary that I should, I think. That is all. And she turned away. Miss Polly's arrangements for the comfort of her niece Pollyanna were complete. In the kitchen Nancy sent her flat iron with a vicious dig across the dish towel she was ironing. Light hair, red checked gingham dress and straw hat, all she knows indeed. Well, I'd be ashamed to own it up, that I would, I would. And her, my onlyest niece, what was a coming from way across the continent? Promptly at twenty minutes to four the next afternoon, Timothy and Nancy drove off in the open buggy to meet the expected guest. Timothy was Old Tom's son. It was sometimes said in the town that if Old Tom was Miss Polly's right-hand man, Timothy was her left. Timothy was a good-natured youth, and a good-looking one as well. Short as had been Nancy's stay at the house, the two were already good friends. Today, however, Nancy was too full of her mission to be her usual talkative self, and almost in silence she took the drive to the station and alighted to wait for the train. Over and over in her mind she was saying it, light hair, red-checked dress, straw hat. Over and over again she was wondering just what sort of child this Pollyanna was, anyway. I hope for her sake she's quiet and sensible and don't drop knives or bang doors, she sighed to Timothy, who had sauntered up to her. Well, if she ain't, nobody knows what'll become of the rest of us, grinned Timothy. Imagine Miss Polly and a noisy kid. Gory, there goes the whistle now. Oh, Timothy, I—I I think it was mean to send me, chattered the suddenly frightened Nancy, as she turned and hurried to a point where she could best watch the passengers alight at the little station. It was not long before Nancy saw her, the slender little girl in the red-checked gingham with two fat braids of flaxen hair hanging down her back. Beneath the straw hat, an eager, freckled little face turned to the right and to the left, plainly searching for someone. Nancy knew the child at once, but not for some time could she control her shaking knees sufficiently to go to her. The little girl was standing quite by herself when Nancy finally did approach her. "'Are you Miss Pollyanna?' she faltered. The next moment she found herself half smothered in the clasp of two gingham-clad arms. "'Oh, I'm so glad, glad, glad to see you!' cried an eager voice in her ear. Of course I'm Pollyanna, and I'm so glad you came to meet me. I hoped you would. You—you you did? stammered Nancy, vaguely wondering how Pollyanna could possibly have known her and wanted her. You—you you did? she repeated, trying to straighten her hat. Oh, yes, and I've been wondering all the way here what you look like cried the little girl, dancing on her toes, and sweeping the embarrassed Nancy from head to foot with her eyes. And now I know, and I'm glad you look just like you do look. Nancy was relieved just then to have Timothy come up. 
Pollyanna's words had been most confusing. "'This is Timothy. Maybe you have a trunk?' she stammered. "'Yes, I have,' nodded Pollyanna importantly. "'I've got a brand new one. The ladies' aid bought it for me. And wasn't it lovely of them, when they wanted the carpet so? Of course, I don't know how much red carpet a trunk could buy, but it ought to buy some, anyhow. Much as half an aisle, don't you think?' I've got a little thing here in my bag that Mr. Gray said was a check, and that I must give it to you before I could get my trunk. Mr. Gray is Mrs. Gray's husband. They're cousins to Deacon Carr's wife. I came east with them, and they're lovely. And—and and there, here it is, she finished, producing the check after much fumbling in the bag she carried. Nancy drew a long breath. Instinctively she felt that someone had to draw one after that speech. Then she stole a glance at Timothy. Timothy's eyes were studiously turned away. The three were off at last, with Pollyanna's trunk in behind, and Pollyanna herself snugly ensconced between Nancy and Timothy. During the whole process of getting started, the little girl had kept up an uninterrupted stream of comments and questions, until the somewhat dazed Nancy found herself quite out of breath trying to keep up with her. There! Isn't this lovely? Is it far? I hope tis. I love to ride," sighed Pollyanna, as the wheels began to turn. Of course, if tisn't far, I shan't mind, though, cause I'll be glad to get there all the sooner, you know. What a pretty street! I knew twas going to be pretty. Father told me. She stopped with a little choking breath. Nancy looked at her apprehensively, saw that the little chin was quivering, and that her eyes were full of tears. In a moment, however, she hurried on, with a brave lifting of her head. Father told me all about it. He remembered, and—and and I ought to have explained before. Mrs. Gray told me to at once about this red gingham dress, you know, and why I'm not in black. She said you'd think twas queer. But there weren't any black things in the last missionary barrel, only a lady's velvet bosque, which Deacon Carr's wife said wasn't suitable for me at all. Besides, it had white spots, worn, you know, on both elbows and some other places. Part of the lady's aide wanted to buy me a black dress and hat, but the other part thought the money ought to go toward the red carpet they're trying to get, for the church, you know. Mrs. White said maybe it was just as well, anyway, for she didn't like children in black. That is, I mean, she liked the children, of course, uh, but not the black part. Pollyanna paused for breath, and Nancy managed to stammer. Well, I'm sure it, it'll be all right. I'm glad you feel that way. I do, too, nodded Pollyanna again, with that choking little breath. Of course, it wouldn't have been a good deal harder to be glad in black. Glad? gasped Nancy, surprised into an interruption. Yes that father's going to heaven to be with mother and the rest of us, you know. He said I must be glad. But it's been pretty hard to, to do it, even in red gingham, because I, I wanted him so, and I couldn't help feeling I ought to have him, especially as mother and the rest have God and all the angels. Well, I didn't have anybody but the lady's aid. But now I'm sure it'll be easier because I've got you, Aunt Polly, and I'm so glad I've got you. Nancy's aching sympathy for the poor little forlornness behind her turned suddenly into shocked terror. Oh, but uh, but you've made an awful mistake, d dear, she faltered. I'm only Nancy. I ain't your Aunt Polly at all. You, you aren't? stammered the little girl in plain dismay. No, I'm only Nancy. I never thought of you taking me for her. We, we ain't a bit alike, we ain't, we ain't. Timothy chuckled softly. But Nancy was too disturbed to answer the merry flash from his eyes. "'But who are you?' questioned Pollyanna. "'You don't look a bit like a lady's aider.' Timothy laughed outright this time. "'I'm Nancy, the hard girl. I do all the work except the washing and hard ironing. Miss Durgin does that.' "'But there is an Aunt Polly,' demanded the child anxiously. "'You bet your life there is,' cut in Timothy. Pollyanna relaxed visibly. "'Oh, that's all right, then.' There was a moment's silence, and then she went on brightly. And do you know, I'm glad after all that she didn't come to meet me, because now I've got her still coming and I've got you besides. Nancy flushed. Timothy turned to her with a quizzical smile. I call that a pretty slick compliment, he said. Why don't you thank the little lady? I, I was thinking about Miss Polly, faltered Nancy. 
Pollyanna sighed contentedly. I was, too. I'm so interested in her. You know, she's all the aunt I've got, and I didn't know I had her for ever so long. Then Father told me. He said she lived in a lovely great big house way on top of a hill. She does. You can see it now, said Nancy. It's that big white one with the green blinds way ahead. Oh, how pretty! And what a lot of trees and grass all around it. I never saw such a lot of green grass seem so all at once. Is my Aunt Polly rich, Nancy? Yes, miss. I'm so glad. It must be perfectly lovely to have lots of money. I never knew anyone that did have, only the whites. There are some rich. They have carpets in every room and ice cream sundaes. Does Aunt Polly have ice cream sundaes? Nancy shook her head. Her lips twitched. She threw a merry look into Timothy's eyes. No, miss, your aunt don't like ice cream, I guess. At least wise, I never saw it on her table. Pollyanna's face fell. Oh, doesn't she? I'm so sorry. I don't see how she can help liking ice cream. But anyhow, I can be kind of glad about that, cause the ice cream you don't eat can't make your stomach ache, like Mrs. White's did. That is, I ate hers, you know, lots of it. Maybe Aunt Polly has got the carpets, though. Yes, she's got the carpets. In every room? Well, in almost every room, answered Nancy, frowning suddenly at the thought of that bare little attic room where there was no carpet. Oh, I'm so glad, exulted Pollyanna. I love carpets. We didn't have any, only two little rugs that came in a missionary barrel, and one of those had ink spots on it. Mrs. White had pictures, too, perfectly beautiful ones of roses and little girls kneeling and a kitty and some lambs and a lion. Uh, not together, you know, the lambs and the lion. Oh, of course the Bible says they will sometimes, but they haven't yet. That is, I mean, Mrs. White's haven't. Don't you just love pictures? I, I don't know, answered Nancy in a half-stifled voice. I do. We didn't have any pictures. They don't come in the barrels much, you know. There did two come once, though. But one was so good, father sold it to get money to buy me some shoes with, and the other was so bad it fell to pieces just as soon as we hung it up. Glass, it broke, you know. And I cried. But I'm glad now we didn't have any of those nice things, cause I shall like Aunt Polly's all the better, not being used to em, you see. Just as it is when the pretty hair ribbons come in the barrels after a lot of faded out brown ones. My, but isn't this a perfectly beautiful house? She broke off fervently as they turned into the wide driveway. It was when Timothy was unloading the trunk that Nancy found an opportunity to mutter low in his ear. Don't you never say nothing to me again about leaving, Timothy Durgin. You couldn't hire me to leave. Leave, I should say not, grinned the youth. You couldn't drag me away. It'll be more fun here now with that kid round than moving picture shows every day. Fun, fun, repeated Nancy indignantly. I guess it'll be something more than fun for that blessed child when them two tries to live together. And I guess she'll be needing some rock to fly to for refuge. Well, I'm a-going to be that rock, Timothy. I am, I am, she vowed as she turned and led Pollyanna up the broad steps. End of chapter 3